Is he worthy? Man, I can't sing that song without choking up. So um, I just have a feel when I sing that song and I, I think, is he worthy? The obvious answer, yes, but you can't say he is worthy without also accepting that you're not. And I don't feel worthy to be here. They keep asking me to come back and preach, so I guess I'm doing something right. Um, but I never feel worthy. I never feel like I'm the one that should be up here. I always feel inadequate. Uh, but the Lord can still use that. And so that's what I hope you hear today. I hope you hear the Lord. Um, as Dr. J said, Kenneth is going to be preaching next week, and me and him uh, started talking about what we're going to talk about this for our sermons. What are we going to preach on? And we started talking about Christian culture. Um, if there's any a time that the church needs to be the church in this country, even in the world, uh, we need a change of culture. And, and that's kind of what we were, we were talking about. And then paired with uh, Dr. J and, and uh, the, uh, I think Jared as well, their, their sermons were the high importance of. Uh, so I, I made it the high importance of the kingdom. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, to prove that I'm inadequate, I also did not give the verses to Dr. J that were correct. It's and verse 3. I said 1 and 2, uh, but it should be 1 through 3. So if you're taking notes, you might want to adjust that. That's my fault. That's, you can see, inadequacy right there. I just can't even tell them what verses I'm preaching on. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to go through Psalm 110, verses 1 through 3, if you want to um, uh, turn in your Bibles there while I'm giving us a brief introduction uh, this Christian culture that we're going to talk about, we don't really see that terminology very much in the New Testament. Instead, you see people talking about the kingdom. Um, you see also in the New Testament, they say the way, right? That, uh, what is that um, uh, Disney Plus show with uh, the Mandalorian? They, they say this is the way, right? That's, uh, uh, that's, uh, they stole that from the Bible, right? They stole that from early Christians, right? They didn't call themselves Christians back then. They just said, this is the way, right? The, and that's what it became, the way. And then they were called Christians later as kind of a, you know, almost as a, as a put down because uh, they followed Christ and, and they just took it on as brand, right? We're, we're Christians. They started calling themselves that. Um, but we also see, uh, because early Christians were Jewish, they used Jewish terminology, and this kingdom of heaven, uh, we, we see it very much in the Gospels uh, it, it being used. Uh, and that terminology isn't as in vogue as it once was in, in Christian vernacular. Um, in fact, some of you here may never have heard it. Uh, you, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, uh, and you may not be able to define it. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, a kingdom is a territory ruled by a king. We, we all know that. Uh, so this must be the, the, where uh, the, the king rules, right? The, the, the God rules, right? Um, and since God is everywhere and he's created all things, then the kingdom of heaven just means everywhere, right? Well, no. <laughs> that's, that's not what, what is being conveyed uh, in the New Testament because we see John the Baptist announce things like in Matthew uh, 3, 2, he says the kingdom is near, so if the kingdom is everywhere, how can it now be near, right? That doesn't make any sense. So it can't be everywhere. The kingdom of heaven isn't everywhere. It's something that's coming on. And, and the Old Testament helps give us perspective of what is being preached. Because you've got to remember, the, peop, the early church were, were mostly Jewish, right? The, 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 the early converts to the church were Jews. Um, and they understood this idea of the kingdom of heaven and its coming um, because they know what the Old Testament promised. They knew the scriptures. This is talking about the messianic kingdom, and it's coming, right? This is what they're, they're talking about, and it, and it is going to be progressing through. So the Old Testament understanding of this prophesied Messiah is that he will be more than just a savior, but an actual king. And this implies that the kingdom is not just spiritual, but it is manifested on earth. And one of those Old Testament passages that help us kind of put this idea of a kingdom um, that, is, that is coming from heaven, right? A spiritual kingdom being made manifest on physical earth. Uh, that passage is Psalm 110. And Psalm 110 uh, is a prophetic psalm written by King David himself. Um, uh, it is also uh, the most cited verse of the Old Testament by New T Testament authors. So uh, as Kenneth was practicing this morning, he was talking about a song. He said, this one's a banger, right? That's, that's the terminology he used. And I laughed because 
early church, Psalm 10, 110 would have been a banger. They all loved it, right? They, 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 if they had Judean top 40, right, this would be number one on the charts, right? Um, so they knew that they all knew this song. It was widely known because of what it promised to a people that had been through so much, right? Let's think about since David wrote this to where the early church would have been uh, about the time of Christ, right? David dies. David, the greatest king that Judah ever had, right, that Israel ever had, um, he dies. And then after his son Solomon dies, the kingdom splits. Now, I don't know if, how many people are in here in the children's building, but we've been going through this uh, in the past few months, so they should all know this sort of a timeline. And after Solomon dies, the kingdom split, right? You have northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. Then you have these hostile nations like Assyria and Babylon come in, and they just wreck everything, take everybody. Uh, the Babylonians take the best and brightest that Judah has and takes them back to Babylon, and they're there for 70 years. And then when they come back, they, they, they interact with, we don't see this uh, in text because this happens in, in the 400 years of silence, but people like Alexander the Great come in and start Hellenizing the area, meaning making it more Greek, less Jewish. So that went over well, right? Um, and then, uh, then after Alexander the Great, Rome starts to occupy the area, and then not to mention 400 years of silence. They are not hearing from God. So they are pretty uh, in, in a low place right? They are in a low place. But when they would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath and someone had Psalm 110 queued up, they were singing it from their bellies because they loved this idea of the messianic king coming back to establish his kingdom, to take back and, and, and reestablish his children, right? To protect them. Um, we, we talked about uh, Zechariah, uh, today in, in, in children's, uh, or in the in community group with, in the children's building, and he talks about when they're rebuilding the temple, all the people around them, their neighbors, they didn't like that they were rebuilding the temple. And so they, they, they started putting pressure on, uh, on Judah, and uh, uh, they stopped doing it. And Zechariah came to him and said, no, 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 keep going, because this is the promise. And he gives them the promise of the Messiah. He says, well, one day I'm coming, and I'm going to take all these false idols that all these people believe in, and they're going to be under my feet. And then that streak, that, that boom, Psalm 110 cues up, right? Isn't it weird that we memorize songs better than we memorize Scripture? It's like music just helps us remember. And the minute they say that, those lyrics that David wrote are in their mind, right? Psalm 110. And, and then they took heart and they rebuilt the temple. The temple, Zerubbabel, that's why I stuttered there. Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple. Um, and they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So it was a very passionate song, this idea of the promised, the promised Messiah, right? The people had a desire to see the kingdom come. Now, they don't understand it as well as we do, right? They were looking into the future. We get the privilege of being able to look back and see the prophecy being fulfilled. And that was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? That was the promised Messiah who, after his resurrection, is reigning over this kingdom, right? This kingdom that has come, right? He is reigning over it right now, right? He is on the throne right now. And we're going to see that in the text this morning of Psalm 110. Um, we, we, we said things, uh, I'm trying to think, worthy is the lamb. We sang that song. It said, seated on his throne. That, that's coming from Psalm 110 and other places, but Psalm 110 is one that mentions that Jesus Christ is on the throne. So let's read the text, Psalm 110, uh, verses 1 through 3. This is again a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand and, until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. Let's pray real quick and we'll dig into our uh, uh, sermon this morning. Lord, we thank you for the Messiah, the promised one. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that uh, you always fulfill your promises. And we see in the Old Testament how you promised over and over and over again the seed of David would come. He would conquer death. Uh, he would conquer all enemies that are opposed to you. And Lord, you promised to reestablish your kingdom. And that should bring joy. It brought joy to the hearts of the Jews. It should bring joy to the heart of the Gentile Christians as well. 
uh, Lord, to see your kingdom come and, and your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That is an amazing prayer. That's how we were taught to pray by Jesus. And uh, Lord, we just pray for that now. We pray that our hearts uh, become light and merry at the thought of your kingdom uh, moving on this earth and you putting your enemies as your footstool. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so the big idea, uh, I try to uh, mimic Dr. J because he's one of my favorite preachers. Uh, so he always has a big idea, which that's, everyone should have some central uh, theme that they're going to talk about. But the primary objective, this is my big idea, the primary objective of the New Testament church is to willingly participate in the furthering of the kingdom of God through which the Father puts all enemies under the feet of King Jesus. That's going to be my big idea uh, today. So my first point in that, is Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah, and he is ruling and reigning now. And that's, we see that in Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, right? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. So when we read that, we, we have some questions that come up. And, uh, when, when we read that as Gentile Christians, maybe not as familiar with the Old Testament, uh, and, and maybe even at that, even in the time of Jesus, they were questioning who this was. They didn't believe it was Jesus of Nazareth, that's for sure. Uh, the Orthodox Jews didn't. Um, so the, that first question uh, and that we should come to our mind is, who is my Lord that David is talking about right here? All right, we know the Lord, right? The Lord, as Dr. Jay's explained to us, that's how the English rendition of the, the word Yahweh, right, that, uh, that the Hebrews would have used. But also the Hebrews didn't like, used that word. They didn't say Yahweh. They just wrote letters uh, that meant Yahweh. Um, and then they, we also get the word Jehovah from that. They used the, the, the vowels from the word Adonai and put them into Yahweh. And then uh, over time, the English derivative of that was Jehovah. So this, the first Lord, the one all caps, that means Yahweh or Jehovah. That is the one true God. That is the great I am. That's who David's talking about there. But then David says, the Lord says to my Lord, there's a differential, a differential, a differentiating, that's the right word. There's differentiating here between the, the Lord and my Lord. Uh, my Lord is the word Adonai, right? That, that, that is the, um, uh, the word we get from Hebrew uh, here. That, that it means like you, you're, you're, you're leader, you're, you're, uh, you're sovereign, right? That's the, my Lord. But David is the king, so who would be David's Lord, right? If it's not Yahweh then who is David's Lord, right? That, that is the first question, right? Um, David knows that there is one coming from his lineage that will be greater than him, and this is the promised Messiah. This is a prophetic psalm. David is speaking of the one that would come from the tribe of Judah. We sang it in a song, the Lion of Judah, the, the Root of David, right? We, we, we sang that in those songs earlier. David knew about this and was prophesying of the Messiah. So this is a messianic psalm that, uh, that David is talking about here. Uh, we also see this in the New Testament, right? In, in Jesus' ministry, he asked a very puzzling question about the Messiah. How can a son of David, one that comes after David, be called Lord by David, right? We see that in, throughout the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew twenty-two forty-four, 44, Mark 12, 36, Luke 20, 42, 43. It's always the same uh, conversation. Jesus asks the Pharisees, if, if the seed of David comes after David, how does David call him my Lord? Wouldn't, David's more, is preeminent. If it was just his grand, great, 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 great grandchild, wouldn't he still be superior? Why would he call his grandson Lord? Now, grandfathers, how many of you are calling your grandson Lord, all right? No, no one would, right? So there has to be more to this question, and the answer lies in the incarnation. Only the God-man, the one who existed in eternity past, but humbled himself by taking the form of man, only he can be both the son of David and come before David. So he's the only piece that fits that puzzle. Everybody, anybody do puzzles and you're trying to find that one that fits that one perfect spot? Jesus is the only one in this puzzle that, uh, that left the Pharisees dumbfounded. They didn't have an answer, right? They never answered. And then this is what Jesus would use as an example. It's like, don't listen to these jokers, right? I just asked them this question. They can't even answer this basic question, right? And you're going to listen to these guys? They don't know anything, right? That's what Jesus always used that as an illustration for. And to, 
continue to prove that this is speaking of the Messiah and who Jesus Christ is, we can turn to Acts 2, 29 through 36. If you'll turn there for me. Acts 2, 29 through 36. This is one of those instances where Peter is, is preaching, and, and he refers to this psalm that they all would know. Because, again, they sing it with their bellies. They love this one, right? They, they love this song. I asked um, Kenneth, what's the song in our church that, you know, every generation just belts out? And we had, we had a difference. Uh, everybody had different uh, opinions. It as well was one that was mentioned. Um, uh, what was the one you mentioned? In Christ alone. That was one that he said that when he's looking out on the audience, everyone's lifting hands, singing, singing with their bellies, as I like to say. Um, that, that, that's, a, that's a song in our church. Psalm 110 was that for, for the, uh, the Jews. They love the idea of, of the Messiah coming and, and restoring everything. So Peter knows that. He's very familiar with the psalm, and he uses it as evidence of the fulfilled messianic, messianic prophecy. And we'll read Acts 2, 29 through 36. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to, the, to this day. Right? David, very important figure, right? They loved King David. And he's like, yeah, he's dead right over there, right? So this, this, this is what we're about to talk about. This is someone greater than him because he didn't stay dead. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This is another psalm that David wrote. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So the apostle Peter is preaching and he is using Psalm 110, and he says, The my Lord that David is speaking about in Psalm 110, that is Jesus Christ, who you guys murdered. Right? That was the, that was the weight. That was the, the message that Peter gives to them, and it just wrecks them. Right? They've been singing this song forever. We want the Messiah. We want the Messiah. And they, they sing it with their bellies, and they love it. And Peter said, Actually, he came, and you guys killed him. And they're just cut to the heart. We see that. And in, in, in if we finish the book of Acts, they're just cut to the heart that they've killed the Messiah because they know truth. They know truth when it was heard, and, and Peter gives them the truth, and it wrecks them because they saw everything that Jesus did. They knew this Jesus that Peter speaks of, and they knew full well he was the Messiah, and they murdered him. And so we have that same understanding. When we read Psalm 110, we know that my Lord, he is speaking of here, speaking of here is Christ. The next question as we read Psalm 10 verses 1 and 2 is, how do we know that Christ is reigning over his kingdom now? Right? Because I stated that. I said Christ is reigning now. Right? But we don't see him. Right? How is he reigning now? Well, when a king sits on the throne, that is the beginning of his rule. Right? And that's what David writes. He says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Right? The position of honor at the right hand of the Father, his throne, sit on it, and that begins the reign of the king. Right? That begins the reign of King Jesus. And then he tells him, rule in the midst of your enemies. Are there enemies present now? Does Jesus have present enemies present now that are confronting the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's happening right now in this very moment the enemy is attacking, right? In our minds. Where are our minds going in this very moment? The enemy is attacking. So rule in the midst of your enemies, right? It's not rule when everything's perfect. Rule now. Rule in the midst of your enemies. You see, the incarnation was the inauguration of the kingdom, but the ascension was the coronation of our king. 
right? The kingdom was coming. The kingdom was at hand when Jesus was there. He, was, he died, right, for the sins of the church, and then he resurrected. That shows that God was like, yep, that's my guy. That's the Messiah. That's the king. And then he ascended to heaven to sit on his throne, and he is ruling and reigning now. That is an amazing God. That is the God-man. That is Jesus Christ. That is our king. Christ is reigning now, but there is more to do. His enemies are still numerous. When will Christ return to deal with this? This leads to the next point. My next point is, Christ will remain at the right hand of the Father until all of Christ's enemies have been subdued. We see that in verse 1. Let's read Psalm 110, verse 1 again. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, condition, until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, what is a footstool? Well, we all should know what a footstool is, right? When you get home from work, and you relax in your comfy chair, and you put those feet up. Um, some of you might have recliners. I have a footstool. You put your feet up. It's not a position of respect, right? It's not, it, 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 your feet don't go on it, right? It's a, it, it is to, it is a, a, a metaphor for subjection, right? That, that you are now a servant of God, and all enemies will be under the feet of the king uh, uh, at some point. So, uh, the first question when we read this passage is, how do we know Jesus is at the right hand of the Father? So we're going we're gonna to turn to a, a bunch of different passages here because we've got to answer these questions. We've got to take what was said in the Old Testament, and we've got to take how the apostles and the close associates of the apostles handled this old text and how they were delivering the message to the early church. So if you want to grow, you've got to go, right? You want to learn, you've got to turn. I've got to use my J-isms uh, while I can. So Acts 2.33 is the first place we're going to go. Acts 2.33. This is all in the New Testament. Acts 2.33. I can use another J-ism here. If you got it, say, I got it. <laughs> uh, verse 33. This is uh, Dr. Luke writing in the book of Acts, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And then he, he goes on. This is an, uh, the, the quote uh, that we, we were talking about uh, of the quoting Psalm 110. But there Peter says, all right, this is Luke quoting Peter, he is at the right hand uh, of the Father at this very moment, right? He ascended there, uh, and that is where Christ is currently. Uh, Ephesians 1.20, we'll see what Paul says about this in his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians 1.20. Gentiles eat pork chops. That's how we, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, Ephesians 1.20. All right, Ephesians 1.20. Paul writes that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So Peter says that's where Jesus is. Paul says that's where Jesus is. And then we'll go to Hebrews 8.1. Some of you might say, well, Paul says it again. I don't believe Paul wrote Hebrews, that's a, that's, so we're not going to say Paul says it again. We'll say the writer of Hebrews, right? Um, the writer of Hebrews uh, 8.1, he says, Now the point in what we are saying is this, We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So if Peter says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, Paul says he's at the right hand of the Father, and the author of Hebrews says he's at the right hand of the Father. I'm going to go with them, all right? That's, that, that is a good uh, a, a scriptural support to say that Psalm 110, that the my Lord is there now. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is seated on the throne, um, and he is ruling and reigning now. Secondly, when will Christ leave the right hand of the Father and return to earth? We see in verse 1, it's when the last enemy is put under the feet of Christ in verse 1. And we can, we can look at, uh, in the New Testament again, how to interpret this psalm. We want to look at the New Testament writers and how did they use it. And we can look at Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. So let's go to, to 1 Corinthians 15. Don't give up on me. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 26. All right, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 15, 25 through 26, and Paul writes, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Christ will reign until all enemies are put under his feet, and that is when he will leave the right hand of the Father. So that comes to another question then. If Christ is at the right hand of the Father, then who is making the enemies of Christ his footstool? This leads to the third and final point, and then we'll get into some application here. The third and final point is the people of God will willingly give themselves to the work of subduing the enemies of Christ. That is the, my third and final point. Again, the people of God will willingly give themselves to the work of subduing the enemies of Christ. And we see that in verse 3. Right? And we'll read verse 3 again in Psalm 110. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The dew of the morning. Like, if you go out and, 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 and you see dew on the grass, you see all those little droplets of dew, they're plentiful. There's a ton of them, right? You're going to have servants that will willingly serve you, right, on the day of your power, which is now. We've established it's now. Your servants will serve you. You see, the Father says, I'm going to make your, the enemies your footstool, right? The Father says that to the Son. I am going to make the enemies your footstool. And then he says, you have pe your people will be willing to willingly serve you on the day of your power. You see, God ordained that he would use the church to spread the gospel of the kingdom. It is through this work that the enemies of Christ are defeated. Right? This includes sharing the gospel, right? Matthew 28, 16 through 20, that's the Great Commission. We're told to do that. That is what the church goes to do. We share the gospel. And you say, Joel, how does the gospel subdue enemies? You all were once enemies of Christ. Are you subdued? Are you at the feet of King Jesus? It works. The gospel works, right? Right, Romans, we know Romans 10, 14 through 17, right? There has to be someone that goes out and gives the gospel, right? They, they can't hear the gospel if no one's going, and they can't hear it if no one's going to preach it, right? So we have to send people. That is a primary focus, and that's one that I would say our church hangs on to, right? We're still sending out people to share the gospel. We might not do it ourselves. We say, well, we'll send, we'll send missionaries and, and stuff like that. That's not talking about me. Well, that's not entirely true. Right? We, we do raise missionaries. We do raise up church planners. We do have pastors um, that, that do that as well. But you also should be sharing the gospel. But this also includes applying the gospel to our lives and challenging others. That is the part that we've backed away from. That is the part of Christian culture that we have forgotten. That is the part of the kingdom we don't like. I don't, we don't like people telling us what to do. We can sit here and say, amen, yeah, you need to believe in Jesus. Well, what does that mean? What does believing in Jesus mean, right? Well, yes, it, it means accepting certain doctrinal truths that are in Scripture, but that's not it, right? He has to be your Lord, meaning you have to do what he says, right? If he's your Lord, you have to do what he says, you have to live your life accordingly, and no one does it perfect, but that shouldn't mean we should be apathetic towards it, right? I can't do it perfectly, so I'm just not going to do it at all. That's not good Christians, right? Christians are striving. We're looking for all those areas in our lives. Uh, I, I preached a sermon where I talked about we got to find the idols in our lives, the things that we elevate above the Lord. If you want to further the kingdom, then you carry the banner of your Lord, right? You carry the banner of the king, and you have to take that to all nations, and it's not just, well, here, believe this, and pray this, and sign this, and you're a Christian now. No, no, no. It's a culture. They got to act like you too, right? They, and, and if you don't believe me, that's what the early church was doing, and, and they got to messed up a little bit, some of them, right? They, they, they were preaching to Gentiles, and they said, okay, you got to believe this. Great. You got to do this. Awesome. And then there's this matter of circumcision, and everybody's like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to go, I don't want to make that kind of commitment, right? And, but that's what the church was telling them to do. That's, that's what you have to do. And they were like, no way, because they knew it was a culture. They said, well, you've got to be like us. There has to be a culture here. We, we, we have to have the same culture. 
And that is when the, the men of God counseled together in Jerusalem, and they debated this topic. They said, well, yeah, it's a culture, but it can't be that, right? It, it can't, we can't be making people do that. That's not what God was talking about. He was talking about a circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. That is how he, we will know his people. That is how we'll know his culture, is the circumcision of the heart. And so they went with that. They, that, that's, that's what they decided. They said, okay, we're not going to make anyone get circumcised anymore when they become part of the church. Well, the men be, be circumcised when they join the church, the Gentile men. Um, so they, they understood it was a culture. There is a, there, is a, there is a like culture that has to be among all of us. John Calvin says, it is the task of the church to make the invisible kingdom visible. That's what John Calvin said. That is our job, this, this manifestation of the kingdom of heaven on earth. We are to make the kingdom visible. And how we do that is worth discussing. Right? Just like they discussed it in Jerusalem, we should discuss it now. Right? That, that should be, the, the Bible doesn't have every situation written down like, okay, this is how Christians handle it. Right? It doesn't say, uh, thou must only watch Netflix for two hours a week, right? It doesn't say that in Scripture. But if we took the gospel and we took this idea of the kingdom, that everything should be about the kingdom, we then can apply that to our lives to learn about moderation for entertainment, all entertainment. We, we, can, we can look and see that the main priority of parents isn't to make sure your kids get straight A's, make sure your kids get into a good college through either academics or athletics, it isn't to make sure they get drafted into the major leagues. That's not your, that is not your priority. That's not your job. What is your job? To teach your kids about the kingdom. That's your job as parents. To show them what the kingdom is like. To teach them about the king. To teach them to serve the king. That is the, the, the priority of parents. That, that's a, that was a sermon a while ago. I won't get on to that. But we'll look at 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. Let's turn there, back to the New Testament. We'll see what Paul says about this idea. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. All right. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 5. And Paul writes, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That is what we do. See, we're not like David. We're not going out and taking the sword and cutting people's heads off taking trophies, right? We're not, we're not doing that, but we are doing that metaphorically in the spiritual sense. We are to be as ruthless to the enemy as David is in the spiritual sense, right? When David routes, when David defeats Goliath, what happens to the army on the hill that wouldn't fight? Well, they go and they rout the Philistine army. They go chase after that. That's where we're at, right? The, 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 the root of David has slain our greatest enemy, and now we're at the point where let's go rout the opposing army. That's where we're at. We're chasing the Philistines down the hill, taking no captives. That is what the church is to be doing at this very moment, taking every thought captive. Everything that stands in opposition to the church, we are to put it under the feet of the king. That is what the New Testament church is supposed to be. You see, it is us against them, spiritually, not physically. We are the people of God. We serve the king, and it is our job to submit them to the king, not through physical means, but spiritual means. That means we oppose things like abortion that we heard about today. We stand firm and bold and give them no quarter. That is what Christians are to do. We are to stand and say, that's murder, because that's truth. And we don't care who we offend by that. We don't care who we offend. That's not our job. Politeness, in this sense, isn't the job of the church. Offending, worrying about offending people is not the job 
of the church. You see, when you speak the gospel, when you speak truth with boldness, when you say what Jesus said, you risk offending people. But the truth is worth offending people. You want to handheld people straight to hell, you go do it. But that is not what the church has been called to do. The church has been called to stand up and speak clearly and plainly the truth to Scripture. And we are to apply it in all areas of our lives, right? Every thought. You see, every part of this world belongs to God. The schools, the society at, at, at large, our entertainment, everything belongs to God. The family, it belongs to God. And every thought is to be brought under the feet of Jesus. See, that's why we have to go when we do these things. Like Kenneth said, find a way to be about the kingdom. Go do it. One person can't do it all. We can't pay Dr. J enough money to go and do everything on our behalf. Right? That's, that's not how it works. You have to pick up your sword. You have to fight. You have to be taking a stand when it's not popular. You have to be willing to risk offense. And not just the ones that we think as the enemy, right? Your own family, you have to risk offense. That's hard. Nobody wants to stir up trouble at a Thanksgiving dinner, right? And that might not be tactically the best, job, best time to do this, but you need to risk offending your family. You love your family, give them the truth. And the truth means offending them. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34 through 39. We can turn there. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. I want you to see this one. Because we have, in today's day and age, we have a Jesus that is basically hippie Jesus. He just wants peace and love. Right? He wants everyone to be happy. He wants everyone to be together, singing kumbaya. Doesn't want any arguments. Doesn't want any strife. That's the Jesus that we're told. That, that's, see, and, and they put that on us, right? When we, when we cause turmoil, they go, I thought you were Christian. I thought you were loved everyone. Yeah, I love them enough to give them the truth. I love them enough to risk offense. That's love. How many of you, if your child was running into heavy traffic, wouldn't reach and grab them and not give a care in the world about their happiness in the moment and what they want to do? You'd snatch them back and you'd scald them, Right? Benjamin scared the dickens out of me uh, the other day. He, just, he, had, he saw a friend live down the street from school. He just walks out of the house, doesn't tell anybody, goes down the street, and he's playing with his friend. And me, my mom, Charlotte, we're all in this huge panic. We have no idea where Benjamin is. We have no idea where he was. I was scared. I started getting in the car, driving around the neighborhood, and I found him. And at the, I had this emotion at that time to both kill him and kiss him at the same time. That was my emotion right? Uh, that was the emotion, right, that I felt at that time. But I scalded him. And you say, but what about his joy and his happiness? He broke the law, right? He did not obey his father, right? That is worth punishment. That is wrong. It is for his safety and betterment that he obeys the law of the father. So I risk offending him on the daily, right? <laughs> That's what, because I love him. So if we love people, we're going to risk offending them. This is Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Or is that what? Yeah, 34 through 39. And it begins, And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after, well, I don't think I wrote this down, Matthew. I'm in Mark, that's why. I, I told you. I told you. That did not sound right. Did not look right either. Matthew 10, 34 through 30. See, I need another little mnemonic like Gentiles eat pork chops to get these right. Uh, Matthew 10, do not think, here we go, this sounds a lot familiar, a lot more familiar. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Boom, right there, right? We all like hippie Jesus, that's what we're all being told, that he's all about peace and love and happiness. He just says it right there. Don't think that I've come to bring peace. Because you know who he brought peace for? The child of God. That's who he came to bring peace for, not to the world. Right? He didn't come to bring peace to the world in the sense that every person that exists, he brought it to the church. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And that relationship doesn't need any more help, right? 
and a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, the gospel causes division, ladies and gentlemen. No, you don't even have to add to it. When you speak the truth, right, when you say that Christ died for the, your sins and you have to put faith and you have to repent, that's where, they, that's where it causes issue. People do not like to be told what to do. That is what we call rebellion, right? The hearts of the enemy is rebellion. And they don't hate you. They hate your God. They hate the king. They don't like his rules. That, that, that concept is our enemy, not the person. That concept is our enemy. The, rebellion, the rebellious heart of the unbeliever, that is one of our enemies. And soon it will be put under the feet of Jesus. See, we should not look for conflict but we shouldn't be afraid of it either. When I sing those songs that we sang this morning, it stirs my heart. I sing it with my belly, if you will. And it gives me this sense of joy, this, this sense of power, you know, this sense of emotion that, that you are the child of God. Think about that. Rebellious sinner, creature from the dirt, you've been made a child of God. And with that comes responsibility, but with that comes so much better things. You, you understand that you can stand against the world and be kingdom-focused and go after it. And the worst that they can do to you is kill you, and even that's not enough. Killing you isn't even enough, right? Because we're, we're conquerors. We're, we're, we're conquerors over death through Jesus Christ, right? So... That is what should be great confidence to us, and, and we, uh, we're going to continue on into in the application here in a second, but we've seen that Christ is reigning over his kingdom now. He is in the process of making his enemies his footstool, and the Father uses the church to subdue the enemies of Christ through sharing the gospel and applying the gospel. Right, that's the first thing. Before you can export it, you know, please do a trial run in your own home. Right? Don't try to export the gospel and you're not living the gospel in your own home. Right? So do, do, make sure you're, you're, you're applying that in your house. But we'll go on to the application. What we do at Crawford Baptist Church is pretty much every Sunday we, we put the gospel definition. So before we can apply the gospel to our lives and share the gospel, we kind of got to know what it is. Right? And this is the, the, the gospel definition that we have up here. Right? And we should all be able to recite it. We all should be able to recite the gospel. Um, I don't know if we have, uh, do we have that slide? The, the, there it is. Um, so the gospel is the good news that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and sent his only son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against sin on the cross and to show his power over sin in the resurrection so that all who turn from their sin and put their faith in him will be reconciled to the Father forever. That is the definition of the gospel. Now, you can memorize it. You don't have to memorize it. Just, you know, you can know the points of the, of the gospel and be able to create your own version of it. But that is a good version. That's one that we put out at Crawford Baptist Church. And, and so we have to know what it is. That's what we have to preach, right? The gospel is transformative as well, and it should be applied to our daily living. See, this is how we cultivate Christian culture, Right? Right? We know the gospel, and then we apply it, and that should change how we live. Right? And that's the beginning of Christian culture. See, if you want, this is a, a quote from Doug Wilson, uh, who is a pastor in, in Moscow, Idaho. He says, if you want a naval war, you have to build ships. And if you want a culture war, you have to build a culture. That's what uh, Doug Wilson says. So if we want to fight the culture uh, in America... That, that if, if any of you look at the culture in America today and you say, hey, there's something wrong here, if you want to fight it, you first have to build it. See, we've assimilated. We've assimilated to the pagans. We let them tell us what we have to do, what's right and what's wrong. We, we let them tell us how to raise our kids, 
We let them tell us what our priorities should be. We let them tell us what school's supposed to be like. We let them tell us what your career should look like. We let them tell us what marriage should look like. See, we've assimilated. We have no culture. We're existing, floating adrift. We're not unified in a culture. The church has to come back to the kingdom. We have to start looking at Scripture and building a culture before we can export it, before we can go attack all these cultural issues. I love the Women's Resource Center, but if the kingdom was doing what they were supposed to, and we could put to death that enemy of abortion, we wouldn't need them as much, right? And that's what we should want as the church, right? We should, we should be pushing in all areas. See, it's all-encompassing. It's not just no abortion. It's, well, now we've got to talk about sex. We have to talk about premarital sex and how that is against the culture, right, that is against the kingdom. And if we can fix that, then we can solve abortion too. It is an all-encompassing, holistic approach to, to a culture war. We've got to look at every area of our lives, every area of the church, put it under the lens of Scripture, and say, hey, this is not how we're supposed to do it in the kingdom. There's a better way to do this. The early church had all things in common in the book of Acts. We're praying for gospel unity as a church. Shouldn't we have some idea of what that should look like? See, we need to cultivate a culture. God, this is what gospel unity should look like. We can say we want gospel unity, but we're a ship without a rudder. Unless we look at what is Christian culture, what is the kingdom, unless we look at that. Well, and, and of course we should. We should have an idea. that This is what Christian culture is. That is the kingdom. That is why we are supposed to be taking, the, uh, this is what we're supposed to be taking to the nations and our community. The culture should then be exported to the world in the hopes that God will use it to subdue his enemies. We have a mission statement here at Crawford Baptist Church. And it says, We exist to glorify God by making disciples through the gospel in community on mission. And you can just underline community because that's what this is talking about here. We need to export the gospel to the community. You need to be willing to risk offending your friends in the community. And I'm not just talking about the blatant atheists. I'm talking about the ones that call themselves Christians. The ones that dare to say they belong to the kingdom and they're not there. You should be offended by that. You, you should be offended by the fact that someone would come and call you a brother and then have no love for the kingdom. Do not want to submit to the Lord at all. You, that should offend you to the very pit of your stomach. There's some of us that are sitting in here today that's all we want from, from the church. I just want a place that I can go to, check my box on Sunday, and then I'm out. I don't care anything about this kingdom work. Well, you're not in the kingdom yet, but one day you will. One day you will be subdued and at the feet of Jesus. Because that's not how Christians act. That's not how Christians talk. Christians have a culture, and we are a culture that push forward the Scripture, and we apply it to all areas of our lives. You see, the kingdom is also different from Southern American culture. We have nominal Christians. We can walk out this door and throw a rock and hit one. They exist. We talk about how there's no opportunities for mission. There is. You just don't want to do that type of mission work because it's not easy. It offends people. And we think the 11th commandment is thou shalt not offend. But that's not true. We should risk offense, right? Philippians 3.20 tells us that we're not even citizens of America. I mean, yeah, technically, yes, we are, but our true citizenship is in heaven. So that unifies us to all the people that are also a part of the kingdom, right? Think about what you would do for a family member, right? How the lengths that you would go to, right? Now, how much you would go to help them and to aid them, it should be even more for your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's your family. That's your nation. That's your kingdom that you're a part of, right? Sometimes we'll have activities here, and we'll teach our children uh, it's not important to go and be part and fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Go do your own thing. And then we don't show up, we don't participate, we don't fellowship with each other. We just come on Sundays and Wednesdays for an hour, and we think that's enough. But you see, the early church in Acts, they had everything in common. They were with each other daily. They were in each other's lives. They were asking each other about their struggles and their problems. Are you making yourselves available? Are you facilitating that type of relationship with your brothers and sisters here? Are you boldly standing in, in, in for the kingdom? Christian, examine your life. Find where you are apathetic towards the kingdom. Find where you have assimilated to the culture of the enemy. How can you do it differently? That is a question we all have to ask ourselves, and we should discuss it together. Because what you're going through, someone else here is going through the same thing, and they want to know. They, they, they have the same question. And that's why on Wednesdays we, we try to have like a, a topical conversation to kind of break the ice, but we really don't have enough time for that. So we need to be more purposeful in getting together and doing life together so that we can see, I can see how you raise your children. You can see how I raise my children. And we should start to assimilate to each other because we were both under the authority of Scripture. Church, so that's Christian. That's how you examine yourself. Church, how can we begin to make paradigm shifts, make bold countercultural decisions to further the kingdom? We all have gifts. Are you giving them to the church? God has given you something, something special to teach, to preach, to sing, maybe to organize. Maybe you're great at planning. Maybe you have time, right? Maybe, maybe you have time to give. Hey, you need someone to go visit somebody? I'm available. I can do that. And this isn't just for the young people. This is for the senior saints as well. Serve the church in a capacity that you can. What do you have to give the church the race isn't over. The fight isn't over. We need you at 70 just like we need you at 30. We all should be finding a way to give to the church because it's worth it. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of your time? Is he worthy of your efforts? Is he worthy to, for you to risk offense to your friends and family? We all have gifts. Are you, and the other point is, are you dreaming big enough or are you limiting God? Think about how we can change things, how the church can go back and be a, a, a beacon, beacon in the culture of America, that they look to us for answers. This is how you do school. This is how you do marriage. This is how you do family life. This is how you prioritize things. And they look at the church and they go, man, how does, how does all the people at Crawford Baptist Church have it together? Like, how, how are they so harmonious and have all things in common? Well, it's because the kingdom wins. Right? The kingdom is, is, is pragmatic. Right? And when we apply the, the, the teachings of Scripture to our lives and we encourage each other and we risk offending each other, then we begin to change and do these things. Remember, remember this. The church will never fail against the enemy. Christ has done what, is, what was required to win. We don't need to fear the world, for Christ has overcome it. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll close.